right, and welcome to Hollywood Blockbusters. I am your host, Joel Hollywood. And once again, I'm joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew. Andrew, I'm the only one in this room born in the 80s. <laughs> Woohoo! That's tragic. <laughs> well, I hope there was a VHS machine playing when you came out of the womb. Oh, there was. You needed yep. to there jump was. on it. There Shut. was. Shots fired in the opening. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My God. Now, uh, boy, today's topic are blockbuster movies of the 80s. And uh, Andrew suggested it, uh, but I am excited because in 1980, I turned 14. I graduated from high school in 1984, had my first car in the 80s, first job in the 80s. The 80s were my formative years, and I will go to my grave arguing that the 80s was the best decade for movies. Uh, you got Spielberg and uh, so many great movies that came out in the 80s, and just the memories, especially when I got my car, of, of gathering friends up and going to the theater and standing in line. You know, the uh, the term blockbuster was coined in 1975 with Jaws. Yep. And there was a period of time where we lined up around the block with, waiting and hoping we were going to get in to see a movie. And if that one sold out, you went to the next one. Um, it was it was a great time to be alive, great time for a, a movie buff. Uh, Nick, how old were you in, uh, in the 80s? I'm uh, I'm born in '79. So. Ah, so those are your early memories. Yeah. So I grew up in the '90s, like you know. So yeah. My formative years were in the '90s, but I had a lot of '80s influences, and uh, all, a lot of the movies that I look at as Hall of Famers, I reference the '80s. Look, yeah. if you're making a, a, an argument as the '80s is the best decade for the movies, you got a hell of a strong argument. I, yep. Yeah. I mean, yep. look, you can point to Jaws and Star Wars in, 70, in the '70s. And yeah. Then, but you talk about '80s from the entire decade yeah you know when we, when i was looking through this list we were doing research for this i was when i was going 80 81 82 i was like gee i was like oh my god they're, they're, they're gold jackets so that's hall of fame reference for football yeah. there's you know they're hall of famers and that they would belong on afi's top 100 or whatever list you want to do top 100 sure. yep. there's at least one in every every yeah. year i was gonna say every single year in every now, genre yeah. yep. in every genre you want to go action you want to do fantasy you want to do drama mm -hmm. yeah on my so, 100 favorite movie list I would say maybe at least half are movies from the 80s. Wow. And I, again, I'm partial because those were my formative years. But, you know, a lot of the movies that are on my list were the top grossing movies for each year of that decade. So not only were they commercial successes, they were critical successes and just huge hit with fans and uh, to to be in a movie theater in the 80s was something special. Movies that are considered beloved classics today, I got to see for the first time in a crowded theater, cheering and, and applauding and laughing mm -hmm. and crying. It's uh, oh, It was just a great time to, to be a movie buff. And it's one of the, t it's weird because I was, I was thinking about this, it's one of the harder ones to make remakes for. I mean, they've done RoboCop, they've done Little Mermaid, but yeah. It's because you can't. I mean, has anyone done Indiana Jones? No. Right. No. And, and, Back to the and, Future. And if they ever try, they will. No, no, no. Andrew, you know Hollywood. You uh, know how money works. They will. But there are certain uh, people that still yeah. exist right now that they can do it for. Uh, yeah, there. Hollywood always tries to go back to the well, and it and more often than not, it fails. When you yep. look at remakes of RoboCop and Fright Night, those did not do yep. well at the box office, and now there's talk of a remake of The Crow, which uh, was the that 80s night. or was that 90s? That's 90s. That's yeah, 90s, 90s. But yeah. like, but still, just don't, yeah. don't. Hi Highlander, the potential reboot with the uh, Henry, Henry Cavill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we'll see. So uh, they they nip, they nip at the edges of the 80s. Yeah, but for the big. Mount Rushmore's of, of the 19 movies, they're not touching them because who wants that pressure? And the legends, you know, um, Marty and Doc are still around. Right. Yeah. yeah. In, Indy's still around, the originals. Yeah. So yeah. Tough yep. to touch them. Yep. 
You know, it's different. Like, you know, there were movies that were remade many times in the 30s and 40s and stuff, but that's because people didn't have them in their collections. Like, a movie came out, it was in the theater for a year or so, and then it pretty much vanished forever. And so a few years later, Hollywood would take another stab. A perfect example is like A Star is Born. That's been yeah. remade many, many times. The problem with trying to remake movies 70s and 80s is that I, for one, have all those movies in my collection, and if I want to see them, I pop it in and watch it. Right. I don't want to see new actors delivering the same lines in a, a remake. Or The Fly. There was a fly before the 80s one, but mm. everyone remembers oh, right. The Fly. With uh, Vin Vincent Price, right? Vincent Price yep. was in the original, yeah. yeah. And then everyone remembers Jeff Goldblum's because yeah. just of the special effects and the, you know how Gina Davis performed in it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. when they think of The Fly, they think, oh, the 80s. No, 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 no. we're talking about the Vincent Price one. But that remake... <laughs> They were going to do that, you know. I mean, it's it's eighties, man. Yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do and encourage you guys to do the same is uh, I have a list here of my favorite uh, blockbuster movies of the eighties. These were the ones that were enormously popular with film goers, and I'm going to kind of start off the list, and we'll go around the table and talk about some of your favorite blockbusters of the sure. 80s. These are the biggest movies of the 80s. Now, when it came time for me to come up with number one on my list, I struggled a little bit because uh, there are two movies in the 80s that had such a huge impact on me, and I have vivid, visceral memories of seeing them in the theaters. And they can be one and two. They can be two and one. It's, it's very hard to separate these. But when it comes down to it, the number one movie, for me, uh, from the 1980s, I got to go with Indiana Jones. Uh, it came out in the early 80s, 1981 to oh. be specific. Oh, you, did, you didn't pick uh, Temple of Doom as your number one? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. We'll talk about Temple of Doom a little bit later. Um, but, you know... Here, I knew Harrison Ford as Han Solo, and, you know, there's always actors who complain about being typecast, and he easily could have been typecast as Han Solo, but he shakes that, that character off and embodies Indiana Jones and starts a whole new thing, and then the guy makes a career out of these iconic characters th throughout he, his He's typecast as so many typecasts as Han Solo, <laughs> right. Indiana Jones, Jack Ryan. Yeah, Blade Runner. I mean, he was but doing like he, your type and, and then that. he did uh, regarding Henry and some other some of the yeah. dramatic, dramatic stuff. So, yeah. so I, I'm glad he was never like truly like pigeonholed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so to see to see the actor who played Han Solo embody Indiana Jones and start a new franchise that was really thrilling for me as as a teenager and. And I may have shared this before, but my memory of seeing Indiana Jones in the movie theater is my mom, a uh, single mom, four kids, would take us to the dollar show to see movies. And the theater would play a movie and then start another movie and then play the first movie, start and then replay the second movie. And as this mom and four kids walk into the auditorium, it's halfway through Raiders of the Lost Ark. So we find some open seats. We sit down. I watch the second half of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Then we sit through a completely not, a separate movie. I can't remember which one it was. But then we stayed to watch the first half of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that's how I saw Raiders for the first time. It didn't kick off with the boulder scene. That was in the middle for me. Um, but Simpler I times. instantly fell in love with that, with that movie. Simpler times. Oh, it was amazing. So it now this is weird. There are different sources online. When I was researching what the top grossing movies were for various years, there are conflicting sources out there. You got Box Office Mojo, which I depend on heavily, but Box Office Mojo has different uh, analytics, I guess, than some other sources like Wikipedia, where you, sometimes you factor in just domestic gross worldwide gross or what they gross that calendar year. Yeah. And so as I was looking at box office mojo, uh, Raiders of the lost Ark was listed like 12th or something. I'm like, that doesn't sound right. It's not because it made it in the other year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it, at the time, I think it set a record for the amount of time it was in theaters. It was in theaters for like a year. Oh. Um, 
Now, most would agree that it was the top grossing movie of 1981, despite what Box Office Mojo says. Uh, it grossed $212 million domestically, $390 million uh, worldwide uh, total. And uh, I think it's one of the most perfect movies ever made. Doesn't miss a beat. Um, it, it dabbles in the supernatural religious realm, um, which, you know, kind of taps into viewers' fears and anxieties, the wrath of God and all that stuff. And that sort of set the tone for the Raiders' movies. That's what was so weird when a movie like, you know, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull came out that they dabbled in sci-fi and UFOs. Yeah. And I'm like, that doesn't feel right to me. It misses the vibe. Yeah. And then and then they redeemed themselves with Last Crusade and, of course, the Holy Grail, which is part of that whole mythos. So... In my opinion, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, is one of the greatest movies ever made. Mm-hmm. The only movie that had more of an impact on me was Star Wars. That came out in 1977. So if we're just talking about 80s movies, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, in my opinion, is the greatest uh, movie of the 80s. Can you guys contribute anything to that, Nick? What you got? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, you're asking me to pick in an uh, do an impossible uh action here so that's why i defer to a mount rushmore so this way at least i get four and before someone has to i miss someone raiders empire strikes back are going to be up there back to the future just because i I enjoyed that franchise as silly as it is i enjoyed that franchise and uh, i would have to say there was a a stretch of because they all came on 80s star trek 2 3 and 4 wrath of Khan, search for spock the voyage home like that because you could basically start from one and end with the other because it was just one after the other Mm mm-hmm and uh, let so, me ask you this about yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark. First, let me play this. No time to argue. Throw me the idol. I throw you the whip. Give me the whip. Adios, senor. Let me ask you this. Now, I saw Raiders in the theater when it was fresh, when it was new, when we had never seen anything like it outside of the early serials of the 30s and 40s. When did you first see Raiders? And what was your reaction? Did you see it on video, I assume, yeah, or cable? I, I saw it on VHS. Uh, I saw it on videotape. I was uh, about eight years old, so I saw it well after it came out. Mm-hmm. And it terrified me. Because first I was in India at the time, and I went, oh, what's all this? And I saw people getting, like, killed. And I went, <laughs> oh, my God, and bats and snakes. And, and yeah. you know, especially the, the, the crypt scene. Snakes. Why does it have to be snakes? <laughs> you know, and so it, it really... It really affected me, but I was was afforded the opportunity because in the '90s I think they were doing a re-release, and I think uh, mm. there were some individual theaters that say, hey, we're doing an individual re- for this week. Raiders is coming out. This Birmingham and a few other theaters would do that. They'd take a yeah. nostalgic movie. So I said, I have to see. You know, my brother would always say, you know, you never saw Raiders in movies. It's different when watching them. Oh, it is. Yeah. So I sat down, and then it, when you see it on a bigger screen in a darkened theater with people all around you. It, it's we talked about this. It, the vibe is different. Oh yes, yeah. mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and I went. Ah, there it is. There's the boulder coming down. Yeah, yeah, and those are classic movie moments. Uh, every every movie on my list uh, generated classic lines from the movie. You know, uh, Indy saying it's it's uh, it's not the years, honey. It's the mileage. <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff like that. It's stuff you you remember, uh, and then and then when you watch the movie again for the. 10th or 20th time you go, there it is there's the line there's the scene there's the moment the face melting at the, yep. at the climax of the movie was i mean it was it was so cartoony because you know a face wouldn't do that under those conditions um but it was it was kind of horrific like what is happening Bad um dates. yeah yeah <laughs> that's right they killed the monkey uh andrew what are your memories of seeing raiders of the lost art um i saw it i was it must have been 89 or 90, so I, w- I would have been uh, probably five or six. Um, and around the same time that I saw two other of my movies that are on this list, which I'll talk about later. Um, now, I don't remember if my parents recorded it, like, off of TV. It would have been, like, its network, you know, release. We didn't have cable. And we didn't have we didn't buy very many VHSs at that point, um, so I I think they must have recorded it off of TV. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, 
as as much as pretty much as much as uh, I loved seeing uh, well the first Star Wars movie I saw was mm-hmm. at the time that time was a uh, Empire or no yeah Empire Strikes Back the second oh, yeah. I, that's what I saw first I saw that before at any other Star Wars movie I loved it I loved the action adventure I loved of course like everybody everybody does the the John Williams score yeah. oh my god that damn. that his score like it 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 makes those movies yeah big time imagine those Star Wars and indie without John Williams. I yeah. mean, they are completely different movies. Yeah. Imagine if they went with the 80s techno sound, oh. you know? Danny and there's Elfman. a lot of 80s movies that have that. And it works for certain movies, yeah. right. but not for that genre. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, 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 the ending, though, you know, when, <laughs> when, when, they, when they open up, yeah. that, the, the, the faces melt. Me being a yeah. five or six year old kid, I, that frightened me. Yeah, that but sticks with you. Do you remember after that? There's uh, uh, a demon that like the ghost, a yeah. ghost that like sh- slowly puts its face up like this. And at first he's like beautiful, right? And, and then, then, then it, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> that's some nightmare that inducing stuff. Terrified me. Yeah, yeah, and. I, I will never forget that. That's um, why they have ratings, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and we'll, we'll talk more about this in a second, but uh, Spielberg is the reason why they added ratings since then, that yeah. PG-13 rating. Because, After uh, Temple. Yeah you, yeah, you go see a movie like Raiders of the Lost Ark, and you bring the kids, and then you're like, oh, my God, yeah. my kids are scarred for life. Also, yeah. also uh, at the beginning of the film, when uh, the – Character uh, played by Alfred Molina, who, yeah. who uh, got bet- the spikes through. Who, yeah, yeah. He, uh, he he betrays Indy uh, for for the golden uh, statue. Yeah, and then he's got the yeah. Is it an arrow? Yeah, the spikes. No, he or- he he broke the sunlight or whatever, and those those spears came out yeah. and got, got him, him as he was running back in the opposite direction. So he was kind of pinned against the wall with spears coming out of him. Or yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. He didn't yeah. pay attention to what Indy was telling him on the way in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, in my in my thing for my modern rush, I left off Ghostbusters, Aliens. I mean, I, uh, Goonies. Oh, we'll get to those. We'll get to those in the. So that, that's what the '80s is. I mean, that's why you know, Joe's like, "What's your best one?" Like, oh, I, I got to cop out and take four. I know four. it's tough. And and uh, I don't come across any Indiana Jones movies like playing on if I'm surfing through cable like on TBS or anything. Um, but if any, even even Temple, if any of those three movies are playing. I'll stop oh, yeah. it and at least watch, you know, wherever it is, watch a good 15 minutes of it. Yeah. And just just to remind myself of how good it is. Yeah, you so know, I, I see people on social media, they're like, name a movie that you've seen more than once. And I'm like, what movie haven't I seen? Yeah, more than like, how much time do you have? Everything. <laughs> like, Raiders is right up there as far as movies I've seen easily dozens of when times. people ask that question i can't help it that that's like a passive aggressive slap at how i use my time <laughs> you watch a lot of movies i'm like yeah okay yeah. maybe i do but jesus it's my escape uh gosh we're almost 20 minutes into the podcast we've only touched on raiders <laughs> i'm gonna go on to number two let me play a little clip here and then i'll share my memories of it steven spielberg presents back to the future a robert zemeckis film Marty leads an ordinary life. No McFly ever amounted to anything in the history of Hill Valley. Yeah, well, history is going to change. And 1985 is not his year. But Dr. Brown is about to change all that. Are you telling me that you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Oh, uh, uh, this movie had such a huge impact on me. Huey and, Lewis. What's that? Huey Lewis in the news. That's right. Now, uh... Here's my memory of seeing it. Uh, I went to the Abbey Theater, which is on Maple, uh, right off of uh, I-75 there. It's now like a computer place or something where it was. Yeah. And I remember, this, this may shock you, but I remember begrudgingly going to see it because my sisters wanted to see it because heartthrob uh, Michael J. Fox was in it and, you know, of Family <laughs> Ties fame. And I thought it was going to be some, you know, teeny bopper thing. I was like, all right. And we went to Abbey Theater, and I came out of that theater a different person. Like, that was unlike anything I'd ever seen. 
And just recently, I, I watched a TikTok video of a woman watching that movie for the first time. So I got to see her reaction of watching Back to the Future for the first time. And I literally had tears in my eyes seeing it through her eyes for the first time and watching her go, that, that's your mother. What are you doing, Marty? And I'm like, yes, that was us in the theater. Like, what is happening here? Jesus, and, you smoke too? <laughs> what are you, my mother? And uh, and so that movie's had such a huge impact on me. And I remember when I was living in L.A. in uh, 89, 1990, uh, my aunt and uncle wanted to go to Universal Studios. And I said, yeah, I'll tag along. And so we were taking the tram tour. And imagine rounding the corner and we're in Hill Valley, the town square, the courthouse. Uh, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Um, it was still set up from shooting the back-to-back -back sequels. And so they had reverted it back to 19, uh, 1985 uh, Town Square, I think it was. And uh, the DeLorean was sitting on the lot. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And since then, I've, I've visited most of the filming locations from the mall where they first go back in time to uh, the McFly home uh, and all the other uh, homes that are on the Pasadena street. Um, I, oh, the school, I went to the school that was Hill Valley high. It's like, Oh, this, they really cleaned up this place. It looks brand new. <laughs> um, this movie ranks right up there as movies that had just a profound impact on me. And, and again, just the amazing memory of seeing it in a the theater for the first time and, and seeing something I've never seen before. Uh, Nick, what's your, what's your memory of seeing back to the future? I first saw it in India. Uh, and so for wow. me, it was just, I didn't understand the concept at first because the concept of time <laughs> travel, because I was a young kid. I was about seven or eight. I was like, oh, okay. Then at, upon repeat watching, I was like, oh, okay, I love it. And it was just the idea of adventure. This old, this guy, everyone wanted to have like this uncle, uh, Uncle Doc Brown. You know? Yeah, yeah. It was the weird. I, what I really loved, I loved his, I loved his house. I loved his, I wanted to see what yeah. his place lived at. And I never got to see that until the second movie. Yeah. When he had to take, when he saw what the 1955 Doc Brown lived like, when yeah. this is this is an inventor's yeah. house. Yeah, and that that place, it's a famous historical attraction. It's called the Gamble House, uh, that was built by one of the founders of Procter and Gamble. And uh, if you catch it at the right time, you can actually tour it. And I got really lucky when I went to go visit it. Um, the the bookstore was open, which is now in Doc's garage. And so I wandered into this bookstore, and I'm like, this is cool. And then they were closing up for the day, so they closed the door. And once they closed the door, there you are standing it. You expect him to open the door with the thing on his head, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was really cool to see that in person. For me, it just that, you know, Great Scott used to be something that Superman would say, Great Scott. But now yeah. it's, I think, I felt that Doc and Marty hijacked it. Because usually Great Scott, this is heavy. All, they almost go like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Hey, think with fly. Think. Now, Tom Wilson, who uh, who plays Biff in the film, you know, he plays the bully in the film, but the actor is one of the nicest guys yeah. I've ever met. I've pretty much met the entire uh, living cast of Back to the Future, and uh, they're all so super nice, and, and Tom Wilson is just great. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, Michael J. Fox is, is pretty ill nowadays, and uh, I went to uh, Philadelphia at uh, Fan Expo to see him in person, and unfortunately, you're kind of rushed through the line. He signed my little die-cast DeLorean, I got to say hi real quick before they shoved me out of there. So you don't get much of a one-on-one -on -one experience with Michael J. Fox anymore, but um, the other cast members are just really super friendly. Um, so what's your experience? Same thing with, <laughs> with, with Indy. Um, um, I'm pretty sure my parents re recorded it on VHS when it was on uh, uh, network TV. And that, along with, Indie and a couple other movies I'll mention in a, in, a, in a little bit. Um, it was on heavy rotation on sat Saturday mornings. My sure. sister and I would watch the crap out of after that the movie. cartoons. After the cartoons, <laughs> I never s saw the Back to the Future. Are you talking about the Back to the Future cartoon? No, no. You have, you'd have you Saturday got up on cartoons. Saturday. You yeah. got your bowl of cereal. Watch you the watched the Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, yeah. The, we would watch that afternoon. <laughs> After twelve o'clock, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, 
Um, and I honestly, um, it I may have watched. I don't remember specifically like I do with Star Wars, but I may have seen the second one, the second back before I saw the first Ooh, Back to the Future. Interesting. Back to the Future Two it is my favorite out of the series. It is. Yeah. See, I, I there's aspects of it I love, but I felt and went too dark, and it's the same complaint that I have with Temple of Doom. It, it went really, really dark. Are you are, are you speaking of the alternate? 1985. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, see, and I, I, I like that. I, I, I felt that it added another layer. Like, whoa! Like, if if you could go back in time and change one thing, yeah, this might happen. Uh, butterfly effect or whatever you want to call yeah, it. Yeah. To this day, one of the best explanations of time travel in movie going that I enjoy. When Doc's is like, this happens. This is yeah, like, yeah. It's yeah. not like Terminator time travel, which is like, oh, this is a headache. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's you know it's interesting. Uh, one thing I learned seeing movies in the '80s is that if there's a trilogy of movies, the middle one is always the dark chapter. Yeah, Empire Strikes Back yep. is the darkest of the three Abs- original Star Wars. Absolutely. Movies. Same thing with Back to the Future, Temple of, Temple of Doom. The middle, the middle chapter of the entire storyline is always dark. And like I said, I, I loved uh, how they portrayed the future, which is so shocking to think that. It was nine years ago now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it just it went so dark that, you know, Elaine was pretty much being held hostage by Biff. And imagine, you know, Marty seeing his mom being treated that way. That was kind of hard. But And I love how they put they templated Biff after Donald Trump. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yep. To the point of having the big, big high rise yeah. with his name on it and everything. Yeah. With, with the with the the. the the, the big the, the big come, come over uh, <laughs> gold hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. I was lucky enough because I saw it, I saw all the movies pretty quickly, and then I came back here and I got to go on the ride. And if you ever never got a chance to go on the ride at Universal Studios, that's like the perfect comic because then you got to be in the world. Oh, you get to go to the wow. time travel thing and you get to mm. – Doc's talking to you, you get to ride it, and you get to ride in his eight-person DeLorean – Whoa. And Biff steals the other DeLorean and is traveling through time. <laughs> You're going through Hill Valley, like in the future, Hill Valley in the prehistoric past. I'll have yeah. the Hill Valley Ice Age, and I'm like, this is awesome. I'm in the movie. I have to see if there's like a YouTube video. There is. There is. Actually, right. is okay. when you get a chance. You yeah, I'll, I'll check that out. I, that's right up my alley. Cool. Say hi to your mom for me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> one final uh, connection I have to Back to the Future is, again, when I was touring, Universal Studios, part of the tram tour was a special effects demonstration, and they talked about blue screen, and they had the DeLorean and, and all that stuff. And then they said, uh, we need a volunteer. And I was always, ah! And they picked, they picked me from the, the crowd, took me backstage, put me in Doc's lab coat, put the white wig on me, and put me on the ledge of the clock tower. Now, not the actual clock tower that right. was in the Times Square or Town Square, it was uh, it was in this uh, sound stage or whatever, but basically I had those lo- those statues, those like gargoyles. Lo- yeah, they were on either side of me, and I had to put the cable together. And so they they say action, and the wind is whipping, and I'm trying to put the cable together, and then lightning strikes, and the platform spins, and I I'm revealed to the audience to be a skeleton trying to put the <laughs> thing together. Imagine being a Back to the Future fan and I'm standing on the freaking ledge of the clock tower trying to put that cable together. That that was a pretty awesome memory. They say enemies cool. a sin, Joe, and I'm trying not to do that, but you make it very difficult. Because <laughs> Joe has a flux capacitor I uh, do. replica. I and have he- a huge uh, collection of Back to the Future props. Uh, from the almanac uh, to the flux capacitor, to, you name it. I and you were used. kind enough to loan it to us for one of our shorts, which we will we're working on right now <laughs> when we edit it because it was one of those things. So it it's one of those. It, it's such an iconic thing that it's now part of like our cultural zeitgeist. You know? yep. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty awesome to have those memories that I can pick up and, and touch. It's pretty cool. Uh, all right, I'm going to move on to number three on my list. Uh, this one came out in 1980. Uh, it was the top grossing movie, of course, of 1980, grossing uh, $209 million and giving us one of the most iconic lines of the entire decade. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. 
But another thing that I get a kick out of is is parents who show their kids that movie for the first time and record their reactions. And most of these kids are in disbelief. They turn to their parent and they go, he's lying to him, right? That, he's not Luke's father. And, uh, God, seeing that in the theater for the first time, uh, as, like I said, I was 14 yeah. years old or whatever, seeing it for the first time, uh, such an iconic moment. And, you know, Star Wars, when it came out in 77, it had a huge impact on me. I got all the toys. I would buy all the magazines. I was curious about how it, made, how it was made. Imagine when they started revealing photos from the sequel. Like, what's that? What's a Tauntaun? You know, like seeing these images of these new creatures and new worlds and new stormtrooper yeah. armor designs. And the, the AT-ATs. On yeah, oh, that, they, yeah, though, yeah. that's one of the great, I mean, that it's, it's so riveting, that whole attack. Yep. And, you know, I, I, I people today go, is, is that the most logical vehicle to use i'm like i don't care it's cool it's badass it's yeah, intimidating those those were awesome to see those on screen for yep. the first time uh so yeah uh, the only complaint i have about empire is it doesn't feel like a standalone movie because i remember sitting in the theater and uh you know luke gets his hand spoiler alert and they stand there at the window as they go, hey, we're going up to find Han on Tatooine. And it's like, okay. And the credits start rolling. And they're like, wait a second. I thought you were going to Tatooine. Like, don't roll credits. I hated that. It just felt unfinished to me. And at the time, you had to wait three years uh, for Return of the Jedi to come out. Not like, you know, the Harry Potter movies seem like they came out every year. Um, but it was tough Seeing this movie, and it's such a great movie, but then to l end on a cliffhanger was tough. As well, a, as well a for fan. the Potter things, because when you got kid actors, you better start getting yeah. the production going because they're going to turn into – you don't want, like, Luke Perry playing <laughs> Harry Potter. It's like, aren't you 40? You, you Daniel don't, you Radcliffe don't, smoking a cigarette. Yeah. You don't want to do uh, Stranger Things season five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. it's going to be – you know, everyone like, all of you have well past puberty. This is going to be very strange. <laughs> yeah. But I think a lot of people would agree that Empire is one of the greatest sequels ever made. And, yep. oh, yeah. and what's kind of ironic about that is that it wasn't directed by George Lucas. You know, Star Wars almost killed George Lucas. So he turned the daily directing duties uh, over to, uh, uh, damn it, I, I had it. Uh, Irvin Kershner. Uh, yeah. Irvin Kershner. Irvin Kershner, yeah. Kershner, yeah. And uh, he brought something to that film. And he had Kazdan help him write it. <clears throat> yeah. Is, uh, he did. That was one of the few times where George did the right thing and stepping back and just yeah. Take the credit. And yeah. I, I've said this before. And I hope it's not too controversial. George Lucas is a great ideas man. He's not a he's not great at writing or directing dialogue. You can state yeah. facts. There these are just, that's and, like saying two plus two is four. And, that's fine. That's... And I and uh Empire and Jedi are I think uh, much better directed movies compared to the first Star Wars? If he had his way, Jedi would have been done by Spielberg because he always wanted to give that to Spielberg, but then he quit the, he, he dropped out of the DGA, the Director's Guild Association, mm. because they kept uh, knocking him for, so why do you always put the credits at the end? You had to put the credits in the beginning, and I'm yeah. going to fine you for it. And I was like, wow. Oh, I, I, yeah, 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 I never heard that. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah, he, he ticked people off. And it's so shocking to think when you watch documentaries about the making of the star wars movies today that the studios had no faith in these movies like yeah. Yeah. they had to shop it around and shop it around until 20th century fox took a chance on star wars and now it's like easy money but um yeah, warner brothers passed shocking. on it universal yeah. passed on it and then wow universal also passed on harry potter so you know they were feeling really good <laughs> yeah. they also passed on this thing called lord of the rings i was like you guys are just like the lines wow. of the 90s and then, of course, there's the iconic moment where, you know, they're filming the scene in the carbon freeze chamber. And I guess they tried shooting several different takes and nothing seemed to work. And they were like, you know, Harrison, just come up with something. I love you. I know. And just, just, just a few words became so iconic. Com like, com completely that improvised. That captured Han yeah. Solo so perfectly instead I, I of love the director saying that it back. Because I remember the curse was like, Harrison, don't think about it. Don't think about it. Just roll. <laughs> action, roll. Just go with whatever comes to mind. Yeah, and that worked so well. So yep. that, um, that, that that was the first real, real sci-fi movie I ever saw. Yeah. And uh, 
still probably my favorite sci-fi movie of all time. Yeah, yep. that is definitely one I, I will sit down and watch repeatedly. And I got to say this, too. When when Lucas started re-releasing the, the, the upgraded versions of the movies, I feel like uh, Empire is the most watchable of the upgraded yeah. versions. Like, yeah. those upgrades fixed a lot of mistakes, and and they they made uh, the Cloud City uh, a little bit more yeah. uh, real world where you, they ch- replaced walls with out, outdoor landscapes yeah. and stuff. And I can handle those changes. Now, Return of the Jedi and some of the changes they the made the musical to number Star Wars. he wanted to put in that he put in? <laughs> show, is, that what, is that what you're talking about, the musical that's, number? That's, at, that's at, tough. At the end of... Well, about at the end of Jedi? Well, no, you're, no, well they did change Palace. the Nub Nub song, but... Yeah. In Jabba's Palace, they changed the the song oh, in Jabba's yeah. Palace too, where they yeah, it was introduced like a, those new characters. It was like an upbeat, song. yeah, yeah. And the one guy, <laughs> and singing, and that was what, like, what 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 are you doing? Yeah, but yeah. From, from from Empire, the only two changes I remember is they show more of the um the snow monster, the wampa, yeah, uh, the wampa, yeah, and they were more uh like outside views, like you said, of, yeah. of, of Cloud, City. Cloud City, yeah. and 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 maybe uh, a couple of the little uh, air airships. Uh, yeah, going flying around. around. Yeah, uh, I don't remember if they made any other changes besides that, but that's, that's what right. I re- what I well, remember. Like I said, a lot of it was just fixing things. Like I've it, seen it, comparisons it, it, where it, it added to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like uh, during the the ad ad scene, uh, when you look at the in, uh, original film, like there are times where the cockpit of the snow speeder is transparent. And you kind of see things moving through yeah. the cockpit. And I'm like, gee, I never noticed that before. So they fix things like that, which was necessary. Okay. I, and the other thing, the other cool factor for Empire, among all the other things, of Vader facing Luke and everything, was Boba Fett. Like Empire Strikes Back gave us Boba Fett. And I remember as a kid, uh, first seeing Boba Fett during the, the holiday special, there was an animated had sequence. had to bring it up. <laughs> I'm just going to refer to the the animated uh, part was pretty cool. And, and we were all like, who's this Boba Fett guy? So when he finally appeared in Empire, it was like, oh, he's so cool. And then Lucas, for whatever his reasons are, just killed him like a bitch in Return of the Jedi. <laughs> yeah. Take Boba me Fett. off. Boba Fett. Luckily, where? they saved him and brought him back yeah. later. But, uh, boy, I don't know why... He dispatched him so easily with, uh, yeah. But he al- the... he also he also uh, did that with Darth Maul, and he shouldn't have. But yeah. anyway, that's another yeah, story. But uh, he wrote and directed that. <laughs> <laughs> Here, this will uh, remind you of everyone getting tossed into the Sarlacc pit. <laughs> <laughs> the Wilhelm. Wilhelm. Wilhelm scream. God bless the Wilhelm scream. So yeah, Empire Strikes Back. Man, it uh, so much anticipation, and it delivered. It was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next movie that I was going to go to, again, this is not only uh, the top grossing movie of the year, but uh, definitely one of the top movies of the decade and was uh, the industry's highest grossing movie for a long, long time. Uh, top grossing movie in 1982, $359 million domestically, $793 million worldwide on a $10 million budget. And, uh, you know, this is during a time period. Jaws was the first movie to crack $100 million, and that became the standard. Mm-hmm. Like, to be considered a, a box office yeah. success, you had to gross $100 or million. Or a blockbuster, at least. If you want to yeah. Do a blockbuster, yeah. Yeah. Imagine a movie at a time when $100 million was considered a success to gross $359 million domestically. It, is um, that in that? No, that's over since. Yeah, yeah, came, it's, yeah, it's total release. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's total total grosses domestically. Yeah, but a seven hundred ninety three million total uh, worldwide. Phone home. Phone home. I'll be right here. Now, here's my memory of seeing this film in the theater. So. What was it? That came out in 1982, so I was about 16. And uh, my sisters and my cousins, who were girls, had already seen E.T. And they were like, Joe, you, you got to see E.T. We, we got to take you to see E.T. Again, I had to get dragged to the movie theater. I don't know why. I don't know why I was hesitant to go see it. Uh, got dragged to the movie theater, and I remember it, you know, thoroughly enjoying it. And then when E.T. wanders off and gets sick, 
I remember looking at my sisters and my cousins all staring at me because they wanted to see me weeping, yeah. and I was <laughs> sobbing like yeah. a baby. When you're a kid, uh, you see shut that. Shut up. <laughs> oh, my God. When you think God. he's dead? I mean, that's... Yeah, he's why the hell lying would you do in that a to... ditch. He's yeah, why the hell would you do that to a kid? <laughs> that's what I'd ask your family. That's what I asked my family. I'm like, why the hell would you do that to me? Yeah, that... Uh, that I'm trying to think. That might have been, like, the first movie I saw where I, like, sobbed uncontrollably. That was tough. And then there were just tears of joy when uh, he comes back. I know? remember that was one of the first movies where I, I was actually clapping when... AT and the kids were all riding on their bikes and trying to get away from the authorities so they can get him out of there. Yeah. I was like, go, 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 go. Like, this is great. Yeah. Now, they, they released that with a special edition, and they made some unnecessary changes. And I guess Spielberg recently said he regretted some of the changes he made. That's in why the, I never saw it. Yeah. They, in the original movie, the FBI guys or whoever they are were uh, chasing the kids with guns in hand. And I can understand looking back going, eh, that's not cool. Uh, they ended up digitally replacing all the guns with walkie talkies and it South just had fell. A yeah. Field day with that. <laughs> and Spielberg was like, yeah, that might've been a mistake. And also they did some, uh, they replaced ET digitally in some scenes and it does not have the same effect as that puppeted costume character interacting with the actors who in some cases like, you know, Drew Barrymore seeing this thing for the first time and reacting genuinely to it. You don't get those reactions with a digitally created character. It's so, a little bit like Yoda, digital Yoda. And, right. And like mannequin Yoda. Yeah. yeah. Yep. There's, there's a scene in the, in the re-release where a he's puppet. in the bathtub covered in water and like bubbles are coming out of his mouth. And it just, I don't know. It just has a different feel. Yeah. I, I like that puppet and if you get a chance to visit the uh academy museum in la they got one of the original animatronic et's on display and to look into his eyes to and there's glass obviously there but to, to see that up close and really scrutinize it it's it's emotional i'm i'm attached to that movie because that was the first time i also had reese's pieces oh yeah because i was because when you couldn't really get those in india at the time so when my, I finally got handled like Reese's Pieces. And, yeah. And I just, you just associate that with the movie. So now talk about, you know, we talk about not having faith in a movie. M&M's was approached and they said, no, we're not interested. <laughs> really? So they went to Reese's Pieces and wow. they flew off the shelves. Uh, imagine missing that, uh, that sponsor. That's some, that's some, uh, pretty well, uh, product. Place to product placement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's a big di- time. There's a ditch in some somewhere in Nevada with a marketing exec who <laughs> made the wrong choice. <laughs> <laughs> a little mound of dirt, or or, <laughs> or at, at the bottom of Lake Mead. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, again, this like I said, this movie was so huge that it was the number one box office draw for a very long time, and I can't remember yeah. what knocked it off its perch i don't know if it was titanic or i, I know I, star wars movies i don't remember oh no it was it was probably it was force awakens maybe i don't know if it was jurassic park i don't know that came close in 93 yeah. jurassic park came close but because in the 90s you started getting these like i call the 90s the baseball steroids where all of a sudden everything started getting augmented You're like are these real <laughs> numbers or not yeah no. but yeah it was it was huge what a what a phenomenon and uh man it, it was i just remember you know being alive during that era like that was nothing was bigger than et when that movie was out ah that was incredible so all right i'm going to move on to my next film uh this is my number five favorite movie that came out in the 80s uh we're doing david ludman's top 10 (laughs) (laughs) now as long as you don't introduce stupid petricks we'll be we'll be fine yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's right uh, this movie came out in 1988. Uh, it was the number two movie of 1988, uh, raking in a total of, uh, $330 million. And again, there's some confusing information out there about which movie finished on top, but most sources agree that it was, it's almost kind of hard to believe that it was beaten by Rain Man. Uh, Rain Man grossed $354 million, which is so surprising for that yeah. type of movie to yeah, be such I, a huge phenomenon. I wouldn't have guessed that, yeah. But the movie I'm talking about... I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that yes, way. Yes, yes, yes. We're talking about who framed Roger Rabbit. Now, 
again, I remember seeing it in theaters with a bunch of friends who grew up on Bugs Bunny, and Mickey Mouse, and all that stuff. And to see Disney and Warner Brothers characters on screen at the same time, yeah. and not just those characters, but like Betty Boop and uh, classic characters like that, that was, that was uh, a perfect storm where everything came together for that movie, and then it will never, ever happen again. You'll never see Disney and Warner Brothers characters on screen at the same time. Yep. They would never allow that. So I am so grateful that somehow someone, Spielberg, I'm sure, used his power to make this happen. But you talk about uh, an expanded universe. Yeah. Or a crossover. A crossover, yeah, yeah. The, the closest that ever came to is Ready Player One. But again, they created right, other franchise, right. but they basically tried to borrow from as many as they could. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, seeing it in theaters, laughing out loud, the whole noir aspect of it with yeah. Eddie Valiant as the, the grizzled detective, the femme fatale and Jessica oh, Rabbit. Yeah. Um, seeing Daffy Duck and, <laughs> yeah. and Donald Duck going in, like, I can't understand you. And it was interesting <laughs> when, you, when you hear that Warner Brothers and Disney had to negotiate for screen time. Like, you know, if, if Bugs is going to be on screen X amount of minutes, then Mickey has to be on screen. Yeah. So they would be on screen simultaneously. And Daffy and and, uh, and Donald, yeah. you know, do the dueling piano thing, and they had to be on screen the same amount of time. And so there was a lot of, you know, red which, tape. Which, if I'm a director, oh, no, I get to use both of them? <laughs> Twist my arm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was it was amazing to see that in theaters when it came out. And like I said, we'll never see anything like it again and when i see on social media people say what what movie would you most want to see a sequel to it would be who, who framed roger rabbit but we'll never see it we'll never see it so we just have to appreciate that that one film do you think steven could use his cloud one last time oh, yeah oh, wow. one last time before he, he retires or what? god can you imagine seeing a sequel that has the Simpsons and SpongeBob and, <laughs> you know, um, Rick and Morty, like all in the same film, Ren and Stimpy. And I love for them to use the same tech, but you can actually make the integration a little bit better now. When they used, I remember they showed Bob Hoskins dragging him to the water. Yeah, yeah. They had to do the special and then they would spin. animate yeah. over the top yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Bob Hoskins saying that when he had to, like, grab Roger by the neck, he had to learn to keep his fist close because if his fingers were separated, that meant the animators had to animate between his fingers, which added thousands of dollars to the budget. And I loved hearing stories like that. Like they would shoot all the live action with the weird little gadgets they would come up with and then animate over the top of it. It was just remarkable. What an accomplishment. I had an opportunity to get the gun with the bullets in it, with the entire case, and I missed it because... I was like, I wonder if I should do this. I said, I'll come back and get it. I had sold it. I own it. I uh, wow. of course you do. <laughs> I Were you own... the guy that bought it? No, surprise, no, 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 surprise. You can you can find these online now, especially with three D printing. But uh, I have the wooden case. You open it up. Yes. There's a little metal plaque from Yosemite Sam it says, "Thanks for getting me out of the Huskow, Eddie," or something like that. There's the gun, and then all the row of dum dums. And uh, it's one of my prized possessions in my is, collection. Isn't like in the velvet thing where you yeah, can, yeah it's like it, red velvet wooden <laughs> case. And Nick uh, is so jealous right now. <laughs> and then you got the voices of like Slim Pickens, you know, which way did he go? Dum dums. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's yeah. I also made myself, and this took some research. I made the the. Uh, um, what was the the guy's name who left the inheritance? It wasn't Maroon. It was uh, the other guy who owned uh, Acme or whatever. Marvin yeah. Acme. Yeah. Marvin Acme. Yeah. Hmm. I I made the disappearing reappearing letter uh, that had his will with the lipstick handwriting that said, "How much do I love thee? Let me count the ways. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. So I recreated that letter, and I had to scrutinize frames of Who Framed Roger Rabbit to try and figure out what the content of that letter was. And I think I'm about 90% accurate oh, in wow. that letter. But, um, so imagine that box with the gun in it, that letter. I have a couple of signed 8x10s by Jessica and, and Roger all in one display. It's pretty cool. You know, it's, it's, who voiced her? 
Oh, that was Kathleen Turner of uh, really? Romancing the Stone fame. I didn't know uh, that. She voiced. I can uh, hear it now. I, I never, yeah. It never occurred to me. Now, she wasn't the singing voice. Somebody else was the singing voice. And forgive me for not knowing that. But Kathleen uh, Turner voiced was it, uh, Jessica. Uh, Adina Men- Menzel? <laughs> no, <I'm joking>. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, that was, that was Kathleen Turner's smoky voice. Uh, voicing Jessica Rabbit. I, I just came across this uh, factoid. Uh, have you guys heard uh, the fact of the budget of that movie? I Did no. I have it here? No, I didn't write down the okay, budget. What so, was the budget of Who Framed Robert the Rabbit? So it, it, was, it doesn't say what it originally was, but it soared to $70 million in $88. Yeah. At that time, it was the most expensive budget wow. yeah uh ever for a film well they they made good on their investment because today it grossed a lot of money today that would have been 150 mm-hmm. and think about we get several 150 million dollar and we get garbage movie. for it and, yeah and and we get uh the flash or you yeah. know <laughs> well they just announced what was it there's a movie that was just announced recently that like ranked up there as one of the highest budgets ever for a film and i'm I don't know if it was Dune or something like that, but it was in like the three hundred million dollar <laughs> range. It's like, imagine you have to gross three hundred million dollars to even think about breaking even today. That's crazy. Uh, oh yeah, no, yeah. No. I, the 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 two uh, the two last Avengers movies, I'm sure, were over three hundred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty. I, th- I think James Cameron's Avatar movies are probably up there because of the technology they were the, pioneering. The last. Um, Pirates of the Caribbean at that time was the most expensive, and uh, ooh, yeah. and they. You talk about a lot. You just talk, <laughs> talk about, about a lot. It's just a lot of diminishing returns. That's I just something we're gonna bury have to, it deep. We're gonna have to dedicate a, a podcast yeah. to the I, uh, the biggest busts of all times, the, yeah. the the movies that lost the largest amounts of money. That could be a whole podcast. Imagine having it right and then just fumbling it away. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we need more Will Turner and Kira Knightley. I'm like, "No, you have Johnny Depp, you have the character." Ah, oh, guys. All right, let's move on to our next one. This uh is widely considered one of the greatest comedies of all time, top-grossing movie of 1984, the year I graduated high school. 229 million uh domestically, 295 million uh worldwide on a 25 to 30 million dollar budget at the time. Uh, again, another huge phenomenon. He slimed me. Uh, Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, again, one of the greatest comedies ever made. One of the greatest casts of all time. Uh, it's fascinating to think that... One um, of the greatest casts. Imagine what it could have been. Yeah, I was just going to yeah. say that. John Belushi was supposed to be in that uh, original cast. I don't know which... I don't know if he was going to be Peter Venkman or yeah. which role he was going to be, but and that would have been a John Belushi vehicle. Eddie Murphy. And Eddie, oh yeah, he, yeah, the, oh, did wow. he like, yeah, when he, he turned down Ghostbusters and they wrote, rewrote the, the Winston character and then, uh, the actor, uh, who played Winston, uh, when he came on board, he thought he was going to be one of the main characters and then he found out that his, his role was cut significantly. It up to like page 55 or 60. Yeah. And he was really disappointed because originally it was going to be Eddie Murphy and that would have been completely different well dynamic. they didn't want to wait for eddie that was the thing eddie what i think yeah. eddie wanted to do it but it was a scheduling conflict yeah yeah so imagine what that would have been but still uh what we did get is is one of the greatest movies right. of all time and and harold ramus who uh, passed away about 10 years ago or so uh he had his hands in this and some of the greatest comedies ever made and i don't think people realize what a genius he was in the world of comedy. He gave us movies, he either wrote or directed or acted in Animal House, Stripes, yep. Meatballs, Ghostbusters, Groundhog Day, uh, you name it. He had his hand, Vacation, I think, uh, either he directed Vacation, I think. Um, John Hughes wrote it, I believe. Um, yeah, so Harold Ramis was just a comic genius. And uh, again, Ghostbusters is a near perfect movie. Just him hits. and him and Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a delivery to comedy. I mean, just there's certain things to say. You know, it goes. Uh, you're you're such a great kind. You're so kind to take care of that man. I don't think he's a man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, Dan Aykroyd. You know, he's a paranormal nut. And uh, he brought a lot of validity to the dialogue. Like a lot of it is scientifically accurate because he was such 
a, a, a fan of the paranormal that he brought all his knotted knowledge in the dialogue. And so it all feels very authentic and, and genuine. I mean, the only thing he turns on the uh, their uh, proton packs and then it, it's making that humming sound. He yeah. stands to the other side of the, of the elevator. <laughs> I'm like, yep. Don't cross streams. Yeah. Next time if someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I visited two locations from Ghostbusters. The first one was in New York. Uh, we were walking the streets of New York and we, we came upon uh, the firehouse. And that was really cool to see. And they really embrace it. It's an active working firehouse today but uh there there are times where they hang the the ghostbusters logo above the entrance and everything so they really take pride in the fact that they were ghostbusters headquarters even though a lot of the interiors were filmed in la uh but speaking of la another location that i visited is uh i was in la in 2019 and i went to the la comic-con and then when i got out of the la comic-con my friends were like hey come meet us at the biltmore hotel and so I, I walked, I don't know how many miles to get to the Biltmore. And I'm like, what's the deal with the Biltmore? And my friend said, you are standing where they film scenes in Ghostbusters. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop is where Eddie Murphy's character stayed while he was in Beverly Hills. And I found out recently that's also where the bachelor party was held in Tom Hanks' bachelor party. What? So the Biltmore has a long, long history and it was really cool to stand in that location where so many great films were made. I wanted to ask you this. When when Ghostbusters came out, it was popular. Was there a sudden spike in hearses being popular <laughs> with the Ecto-1? That's did, a good that question. Well, the, the, the Cadillac Ambulance, I think it's like a 57 or something Cadillac Ambulance. They're almost impossible to find now. Oh. Um, it, people were buying them and turning them into Ectos and when those got harder then people were finding other makes and models that were similar to that. Um, but speaking of Ecto, this is kind of a neat story. Um, a friend of mine and I were in LA in 2011 and we decided to tour uh, Sony Studios and it was kind of a rainy day and we come around the corner and there sitting outside in the rain was the original Ecto-1. It had been restored. And if you tour Sony Pictures today, which used to be MGM, MGM uh, you will see Ecto-1 on display, the original. So it was really cool to see that. In person I want to put too. you on the spot real quick. You have one choice of only one. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang Car Ecto-1 DeLorean. <laughs> Go. Ah, only one. Well, there's not... Not many people here in the Detroit area that own a DeLorean uh, replica time machine. I, I know one person who does. And so I would get a lot of use out of a DeLorean time machine. But Fair enough. I did sit in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. They have one that was screen used at the Stalls Museum. And they let me sit in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And I almost wept. That was pretty cool. But to own, uh, yeah, I would go DeLorean uh, time machine. That would be fun. So... Yeah, so uh, any any thoughts of Ghostbusters? Uh, do you remember the first time you saw Ghostbusters? Yeah, I, it, it, w it was not something I saw uh, when I was young, uh, like a lot of those other ones. Uh, I think I'm kind of cutting in and out. It is, yeah. Uh, it's a ghost. <laughs> but um, there you go. I, s I saw it uh, freshman year of college, which means I only remember bits and pieces of it. <laughs> Have you watched it since? <laughs> I, absolutely not. Really? No, I, I, I wow. just, I've, I haven't come across it. From what I remember, I liked it. <laughs> wow. Of course you did. But uh, no, I, I mean, I would love to, to watch it again sometime. Um, I, I have not seen the second one. I have not seen any of the sequels. Well, the second one is the reason why Bill Murray said he would never do a sequel. He was disappointed with the experience of doing. Ghostbusters 2, and uh, it's okay, but it's not something I need to rewatch. The yeah. first one is a classic. I don't know if they, were, they ever settled on the story. They kept going back and forth on it but from what I heard. So, yeah. No, Ghostbusters, yeah. if you watch that as a standalone, it's great. It's one of those almost near-perfect comedies. I agree. Yeah. Same, yeah, same thing amazing. with me and uh, E.T. I saw it only freshman year of college and haven't seen it since. So okay, I, I need to these things. I, wow. need, I need to re revisit that as well oh man i've seen it so many times yeah and i've met uh henry thomas who played elliot okay and 
way back in 1990, I ran into a young girl named Drew Barrymore. Yeah, in, in I, a speech. I recently saw. I did saw, see yeah. that. Yeah, People, saw saw a picture on Facebook a couple that's days right. ago. Yeah, yeah, her birthday was recently, and yeah. uh, the one that got away. That's right. It says in the captions. Yeah, even <laughs> though it was just a, it was a uh, fleeting encounter yeah. at Venice Beach. But sure, I sure. did have the opportunity when I met Henry Thomas. I I said to him, and he seemed genuinely moved by this. I said, "Your performance in ET is one of the greatest child performances of all time." It is top ten easily, if not top five. His performance was spectacular, and he like paused for a second and said, well, wow, thank you. So yeah, that was, that was, that was great. That performance was amazing. Yeah. I know there in the eighties, there was a lot of sense of adventure for movies. I remember the Goonies, yeah. E.T. Explorers, which I'll always love. Yeah. And the Spielberg, you know, had his hand in a lot of those. If he didn't direct a movie, he was producing or executive producing. Yeah. And, uh, that he's a big reason why there were so many beloved fantasy films, uh, during that time period i yeah. mean he was he was a producer on back to the future as a matter of fact he's yep. i think he's the reason it even got made yeah, he, he took it, for it he took sure. his uh connections he con you know went to his connections at universal and said you guys need to look at this so he was on set you know for the filming of back to the future and you he's you could see his fingerprints on that film yeah yeah, yeah. so all right next movie here 1986 uh number seven for the year uh grossing 86 uh, million dollars it was overshadowed by top gun uh which uh was the number one movie of the year 176 million uh that's it man game over man it's game over you know as as a kid i saw alien and uh, i thought the original alien was one of the greatest movies i've ever seen i remember when it was just a, a staple on on pay-per-view and cable tv i watched it over and over and over and over and over again i yeah. know every beat every line and when the sequel came out directed by jim cameron um he just took the familiar elements from alien and threw them into a blender with like war movies and stuff came out with something completely unique and new it was not a rehash of alien and created again one of the greatest sequels of all time and a great cast and great moments yep. and it was absolutely amazing and alien is true horror and i think uh, yeah and, and aliens is meant to be action it borrowed from some horror but yes it was yes. predominantly action so uh, you could almost treat it as two different movies too, yeah. there's some people like i you know this oh i don't like aliens because it took away from horror. like well don't look at it like, alien yeah. is a standalone horror movie yeah right Imagine the concept of the alien in the first movie wiping out an entire crew with the exception of Rid R Ripley. Now in the sequel, there's a whole army of these things. They you're actually, like, they, oh, yeah. no. Right. And, and, and the, the, the crew actually has weapons yeah, in, yeah. In, in, yeah. in the second. Yeah. And also, like you mentioned, Jim Cameron, he was only a year and a half or two years r removed from doing Terminator. Yeah. So that, that action was still... Yeah, front and center for him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Joe, you can pick them. I mean, 1986. Uh, I, yeah, allow me this. These are the top movies at the time. You can know how to put them in order. Top Gun, Crocodile Dundee, Karate Kid Part Two, Back mm. to School, Aliens, Star Trek Four, The Voyage Home, Out of mm. After, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Color Money, Legal Eagles, Cobra, Jewel of the Nile. These are <laughs> you no. Know, you talk about Michael. Um, uh, Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner's string of doing their own, like they could yeah. almost have their own extended universe of franchise. <laughs> I, I need to revisit Romancing the Stone. Romancing Jules the Stone was great. Yeah, Jewel and I was a sequel to Romancing the Stone. And they were in War of the yeah. Roses with Danny DeVito. You know, yeah. And oh, Police yeah. Academy. The Golden Child, which I was, mm. oh, you know, Short Circuit, The Fly. Oh, Short Rocky Circuit. Rocky Four. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, even American Tale. Yeah. That's a pretty great year for movies. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the Great Mouse Detective. I always enjoy that one. <laughs> Spies Like Us, Iron Eagle, Three Amigos. Oh wow! Yeah. Now we we talk about you know some of the great movie moments happened in the eighties. This is in my top ten, possibly my top five, and and could be an argument for number one movie moment of the eighties. Get away from her, you bitch! <laughs> oh man, when she's trying to protect Newt, and she comes out in that power loader suit, ah, man, I, 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 on my feet! Like that was a, such an amazing moment. 
and that battle between the two of them her yeah. just landing haymakers left and right is great <laughs> one of the best lines that always stuck with me is for a character who i wish I had more time his name was frost when they collect weapons and ammo it's like what the hell do you want me us to use man harsh language <laughs> all right just... right or like bill pot paxton just uh, so many lines like you know, when, when Ripley says to him, you know, this little girl survived, uh, you know, with n- nothing. And he, why don't you put her in charge? You know, and uh, he was so great in that. And I see a meme going around that he was, he's like the only actor that survived an alien or Terminator and there was something else. And he was in Tombstone and Titanic and all sorts of stuff. But it did not survive yeah. a predator. Uh, uh, predator 2, it, it killed him. Oh, but he did go toe to toe with the predator in part two. Oh well, yeah, I mean, yeah. Tip of the hat to him. <laughs> I was like, Bill, just don't. <laughs> He's throwing his lucky yeah. charm at it. God. Well. Yeah, when you think '80s, you gotta you gotta give it up for Bill Paxton. He was just yeah. great. And of course, the uh, Chet in uh, Weird Science. I love that. <laughs> Are you wearing panties? <laughs> that was great. All right, the next movie, again, this this movie came out at the tail end of the decade, but it almost defined the entire decade. I remember the hype that surrounded this movie, uh, the, the arguments, the debates on whether it was going to succeed or not, because um, up to this point, the only Batman we had was the TV version and Adam, Adam West, yeah. and everyone thought we were going to get a movie version of the campy uh, Batman. What are you? I'm Batman. And there is a lot of speculation of uh, Michael Keaton when he was cast. Boy, oh boy, there was no internet back then, but right. it blew up the internet. Um, he 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 was known as a comedic actor. Exactly. And, yeah. And uh, I recently came across a video. I didn't watch it, but I saw the the blurb that uh, that uh, he used to do stand up. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. stand-up comedian. It's yeah. not to the same level, but imagine if, you know, even his physical stature, he's not a big guy. And you're thinking about right. Batman. It'd be like if Rick Moranis was cast as, like, the Flash or something. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But neither, neither is Christian Bale. So he's, yeah. not, he's not a big I guy. I mean, well, I mean, oh, Christian Bale's not a big guy, but when he, you see him in American Psycho, you're like, okay, I can see this guy as Bruce Wayne. I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, he went from the machinist, then he went to Batman. He overshot it. And he was like, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll put on yeah, a little yeah. muscle bar. Now, my defense of Michael Keaton is that he plays crazy well. I mean, when you yeah. look at oh, him as yeah. Beetlejuice or whatever. And I think that's what Tim Burton was going for. Uh, yeah. You know, Bruce Wayne, there's something not quite right with a guy who wants to dress up as a bat and go out and fight crime. And I think that's what Keaton yeah. brought to the role. You want to get and nuts? You want it? Let's, Let's get, get nuts. nuts. Yeah. And so <laughs> he conveyed that really well. Yep. I remember when Ben Affleck was announced as Batman. Yeah. The internet, the internet blew up on that one. Yeah. They said there's no way he can do it. And say what you want about the movies, he did well as that character. Yeah, he 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 did what he could with the material yeah. that he was given. Now I'm kind of excited about something. I don't know if this is going to pan out. And, and forgive me for not knowing the actor's name, but the guy who plays Reacher in the current TV series is that official? I don't know, but he's been quoted online as saying that they're asking him for if it. he's in the conversation. He's honored, but he would be a Batman unlike anything we've ever seen, like someone who just looks physically yeah. imposing. So he's got my vote. I'd like to say I'd like to say at least one thing about Michael Keaton when he was as Bruce Wayne like oh this guy can't be Batman <laughs> when I see the Reacher actor I'd be like yeah I see it yeah, yeah I, I know you see. somewhere Bruce Wayne <laughs> I, it's something about that build yeah yeah he he would be the most physically imposing Batman we've ever seen but Michael uh, Keaton did did what he had to do and and that movie was such a huge phenomenon I remember walking around with my black t-shirt with the batman logo on it and having that a was kid truly what i heard i heard it was nice a, that was one of the best marketing campaigns that, oh, that yeah. was put out at the time. oh such a huge phenomenon and the premiere was all over the news and, you and got yeah. jack palance and jack nicholson to be in that movie and you got kim yeah. basinger yeah and that was that was kind of a, an argument too after the fact was was this a batman movie or was it a joker movie because i think nicholson probably got more screen time than keaton like, he, he he got he, a lot of screen he's time. he stole the the movie yeah and Going back to marketing, that that was the first time I remember uh, getting either for birthday or gifts 
the action figures yeah. from yeah. that movie. And that was the first time getting an action figure based on a movie in yeah. uh, 89. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember I, I had the Batman. Um, I'm pretty sure I had the Joker. Um, I had, um, uh, what's his name? Bob the Goon. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then uh, they had the, the Topps uh, trading cards. The trading they had cards. The, Sega, with, yeah. the Sega Genesis game with, that came with, out. With, with, with the dried piece of gum <laughs> and, and the trading cards. Sure, yeah. I, I had those. And who won the, who won, this is one fast food. Who won the fast, which is McDonald's or Burger King that won the, won the bid? Because whoever did, they just got. Yeah, them. I don't recall who had the the toys yeah. or glasses or yeah, anything. Yeah, I, I, I want to say Burger King because I I seem to remember the glasses, but I, I'm not sure. Because that that kicked off that trend. Yeah. Because then started that all throughout the '90s. Like I remember when the Godzilla movie came out with uh, what's his face uh, Matthew Broderick. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> Godzilla. Taco Bell won the won it because that did yeah. so. Uh, Yo quiero Taco Bell. It's a grande lizard. <laughs> it's like yeah. all right. And we also, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the Batmobile. Like, oh, yeah. you know, oh, yeah. we had seen the Batmobile on the TV show and some of the animated shows and things like that. Um, but whoever designed this Batmobile for the, uh, the 89 movie knocked it out of the park. It looked like a jet engine with wheels with the flame coming out of the back, which was an homage to the Batmobile from the TV show. And they used that and, in the animated series. They yeah. took that design and they put yeah. it in there. Yep. But when they when they reveal the Batmobile, they're they're escaping the museum, uh, Batman and Vicky Vale, and he goes, get in the car. And she goes, which one? And then they <laughs> cut to the wide shot of this black, sleek car sitting out there. What a cool introduction. And then it's just a minute or two of it just zipping down the roads and the leaves blowing and that flame coming out of the back. And it was love at first sight for me, man. That was a badass Batmobile. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. All right. Next up, number nine on my list. Again, this came out the year I graduated high school, 1984. Uh, number two movie of 1984, $224 million behind Ghostbusters. Uh, this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. I need a couple of bananas. How much are they? Well, the buffet plate is twelve fifty. You get peaches, plums, oranges, and bananas. Well, all I need is a couple of bananas. Damon Wayne. Go ahead, take those bananas. <laughs> that might have been the very first time I've ever seen Damon Wayans in any role, and he got huge after that. But uh, Beverly Hills Cop, I remember seeing on the news, oh, they're filming a movie in Detroit this week, and there's footage of the truck and cigarettes flying out of the truck, and people would run out onto the street and grab the, the cigarette boxes as they flew out of the truck, and it was on the news that they were filming this. And then, <laughs> of course, when Beverly Hills Cop came out, it just changed everything. Now, Eddie Murphy had done 48 Hours, I believe. that I think that was his first movie after SNL. Uh, but when he did Beverly Hills Cop, he hit the stratosphere. I mean, another perfect movie on every beat. The right mix of comedy and tragedy. And, oh, my gosh. If I may, 1984, Conan the Destroyer, The Last Starfighter. The Terminator. These are all the Red Dawn. These are all the, the and Revenge of the Nerds, The Natural, Purple Rain, Romancing oh. the Stones, Terms of Endearment, Star Trek Three, Beverly Hills Cop, Footloose, Police Academy, Karate Kid, Gremlins, Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. Say what you will, but it belongs <laughs> in the trilogy. Yep. And then Ghostbusters. And Ghostbusters. Wow. Um, and I Thanks. saw, think about this. I, almost every movie you listed there, I saw in the theater that year. So I must have been in the theater every week. To have seen <laughs> just about every movie you listed. But, if, but the if that's the summer, that was you get out of high school and then that's your that's summer. A, every yeah. summer there's someone competing for you from Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh man. Yeah. Beverly Hills Cop just uh epitomized the eighties and, and Eddie Murphy. There's no one bigger uh in the eighties than uh Eddie Murphy who had hit after hit after hit, forty eight hours trading places, golden child, you name it. Just hit after hit after hit. It was just amazing. Coming to America. Coming to America. Again, one of the greatest <laughs> comedies of all time. Definitely top 10 for me. So, yeah, um, such a great movie. Uh, and now I'm going to hit number 10, and then we'll kind of go around the table. Uh, now, this is kind of shocking. I was surprised when I dug this up in my research. It was the number 10 movie of 1988, which in hindsight is kind of shocking. You'd think it would have ranked a lot higher. Um it is, let's see, I got a clip here somewhere. I should have had it ready. 
Um, but this is one of the most iconic movies to come out of the 80s. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee ki motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I thought about censoring that, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm yeah. not going to censor it. Uh, most people consider it one of the greatest Christmas movies of all time. Uh, Die Hard epitomized the 80s. Uh, Bruce Willis left Moonlighting uh, to do Die Hard and became one of the biggest action stars on the and planet. And no one thought he would do it. No one yeah. could see him because they always saw him as Moonlighting. Yeah. And uh, again, another Sa- perfect Same thing movie. with Michael Keaton. Yeah. Because he had only done comedy before. Yeah. 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 Uh, Alan Rickman knocked it out of the park and went on to have an amazing career. And uh, again, just, you know, it, you know, a movie's great when it becomes parodied and copied and spoofed uh, and, over the next 20 years. And still talked about in yeah. 2024. And, and yeah. I don't know if any of the sequels rival it, but uh, the first one, in my opinion, is one of the greatest movies ever made. Yeah, it, it was fantastic. I enjoyed the third one when they went back to New York for Die Hard with Samuel L. Jackson. But on the first one, I love the things. Were you, were you there? That's just before you got to L.A., right? Joe, yeah, you know, it came out in '88. I moved to LA in '89. Yeah, so because I know a lot of people saying they were complaining of the film, film uh, that, uh, that Nakatomi, that, yeah, Nakatomi. They were saying all, all the local business was going, "What's going on? Wait till you shoot to five. <laughs> I don't know what's going." on. I'm like, "You're in LA. It's mo- it's a movie production. What do you? Where do you guys think you were living? Oh, you know, like yeah. Also, I mean, yeah. And a lot of those explosions and stuff were done with miniatures. So yeah. I, I I can't imagine they were setting off big explosions at the building. Uh, of course, that was a location I had to visit when I was in L.A. Went over to the Nakatomi Plaza and uh, got some pictures over there. That was pretty cool. I, lo- I think it's called the Fox Plaza. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I love the little tidbit that they did with the uh, Alan Rickman when they when they were going to do the drop scene. They, they oh yeah they didn't tell him when they were dropping him. So yeah. that expression on on his face is genuine yeah. shock. Uh, they were like, "We're going to drop you on three. <laughs> One <laughs> drop, boom!" And he thought something had gone wrong and was falling to his death or something. But yeah, that that's a genuine expression and so much more authentic than the drop in RoboCop. Do you remember when uh, the the guy in RoboCop goes out the window and he's got these long weird yeah. arms and he looks like a stop motion puppet and it's like why did you make that decision uh to see that look on alan rickman's face as he starts dropping out of that window and then and then the line when they they follow him all the way down to the ground and the cop goes i hope that's uh hope one that's of them a, yeah yeah, yeah not one of ours yeah yeah <laughs> So, uh, what a what a perfect movie! Great yeah, movie. The principal from Breakfast Club. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> God, I that's hope right. that's not hostage. <laughs> so, your your memories of Die Hard? Also, saw it once. Wow, uh, these are classics, man. Saw it once in college. Uh, haven't seen it since. Wow. Um, but uh, from what I remember little bit of it i remember i i liked it <laughs> wow I, i'm glad at least there's part of your brain says we liked it just, just give, me, give me happy memories on this one all right so that's my top 10 uh nick what are some uh titles that uh, come to mind that we haven't touched on yet well for me like i said i i enjoyed a lot of the uh, sci-fi and adventure type stuff so i enjoyed the explorers i enjoyed mm. doing so anything that had ki- a lot of kid adventures and that's why also, I have a soft spot for Temple of Doom because it has short run in it. Yeah, and I seen, and then I saw Goonies. I didn't watch these in order. I said, "Oh, it's short round." Yeah, yeah. And it's Goonies, and so yep. I, and now to see that he's won an Oscar. Yeah, <laughs> and he's, he's making yep. a comeback in his career is pretty awesome. You yep. know, and he's you know he's in uh, 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 Loki in season two. But yeah, oh. so I I really have a soft spot for the sense of adventure in the movies. You know, you talk about movies like Krull. You know, no one really ever talks about that. And they had yeah. Willow. Yeah, you know, you know, so I, in the eighties, they were always about fantasy adventure movies. Even Black Cauldron came out, and Black Cauldron, if anyone doesn't know, that was a Disney movie. It's the first time Disney went dark, like as in like the scary stuff. And yeah, it they didn't recover until they came out with uh, Little Mermaid in eighty nine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know, I I I enjoyed the eighties. Like their their movies, like I said, my, my on my Mount Rushmore, I didn't get Aliens in there. I didn't get Ghostbusters in there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's. Just going from eighty four to from eighty four to about eighty eight, when you look just look at the top grossing movies and the top movies in there, a lot of these are in AFI's top one hundred and whatever genre you want to go go through action, comedy, sci fi, drama. 
So uh, m- most of my top 10 r- reflects yours, but yeah. I will always have a soft spot for sci-fi and comedy. So I love the action flicks. You know, you can't talk about uh, the 80s without talking about Schwarzenegger, Stallone, oh. Willis, uh, Van Damme. their movies, Van Damme. Yeah, um, The Predator. Ooh, yeah, that was yeah. a big one for me. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's a. I have on my list some of the movies that came out in the '80s that weren't necessarily initially block office or box office phenomenons, but they've stood the test of time and are really beloved now. And Predator is one of them. I mean, yes. that's another movie I'll if sit it bleeds, and watch. You can kill it. Yeah, yep. or yep. or the <laughs> or the line when he's like, "You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed." bleed. Those are such great lines. Carl Weathers, Jesse Ventura, and Arnold. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I remember he, so he, great. In the, in the 80s, he had almost, he had Conan, two Conan movies. Yeah. And, uh, and he had twins with Danny DeVito. I love when they <laughs> yeah. finally figured it out and they said, well, this Arnold represents all the good and great stuff and all the shit left to our turn. <laughs> and they look at Danny DeVito yeah. and I'm like, yeah, when oh, they that's... reveal that to him, I'm like, like that's cold blooded. You were the byproduct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he did Commando. True Lies was yeah. incredible. Yeah. That's a 90s um, movie, though. That was it? But yeah. he just, he could do no wrong. Like Schwarzenegger, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was almost kind of a cartoon character, but mm-hmm. uh, he defined the action Running Man. Flick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Yep. Incredible. Then Incre- he kind of parodied himself in the Super Bowl commercial where yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. what was the word he kept trying to say? Neighbor. 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 Yeah. neighbor. No, it's neighbor. What neighbor. Neighbor. Get to the chopper. Mm-hmm. Uh he it, it's great that he can laugh at himself, but he's really they, embraced. They parody that in the Simpsons when they the radioactive man up and at them. Oh, up yeah. and at them. Up and at them. <laughs> up and it's better. Up and at them. Yeah. Up like, and better. at them. The dialect coach is better. Oh my gosh. And then, of course, RoboCop, uh, yep. another movie that wasn't necessarily a huge box office hit, uh, $53 million on a $13 million budget, so it was profitable. But um, that movie has gone on to become a beloved classic. And uh, The Thing, which is one of my all-time favorite horror movies, came that, out in 1982. Yes. This is shocking when I was looking this up. $20 million on a $15 million budget. And when you read the reviews of The Thing from, like, Siskel and Ebert and other critics of the era, they freaking hated it. They basically called it horror porn. Like, it, it was, they despised it. And now it's, most people regard it as one of the greatest sci-fi yeah. horror mil, uh, movies of all time. It's good to know, you know, some of their stuff didn't age well. Yeah. Cisco and Ebert, because you go, come on, guys, get off your high horse. And they did, like, over the years, they did kind of go back and look at movies that uh, they ended up revising their opinion yeah. of, like, okay, we, we screwed up on that. And I don't know if they ever admitted that on The Thing, but, again, I saw The Thing in theaters, and I was so blown away. Same thing with The Fly. Like, yeah, some of the some of the effects were over the top and, and stomach-churning, but you walked out of there like, I need to see that again. Like, that was incredible. I mean, An American Werewolf in London yeah. came out in the 80s. You talk about some really iconic horror movies yeah. that came out. The Howling. You ever see The Howling? Yep. Some of the most amazing werewolf transformation scenes because it was they were all real-world effects. It wasn't this CGI garbage that we see today that guys like Rick Baker had to devise contraptions to make a human's face stretch out into the snout of a it, werewolf. In Fright Night, when his when his buddy transformed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Fright Night, again, one of my all-time favorite movies. And it only grossed $25 million on its initial release on a 7 to $9 million budget. But uh, Fright Night's one of my all-time favorite horror movies because I love when comedy and horror comes together. Yeah. And there are laugh out loud moments in Fright Night and genuinely scary, uh, frightening moments. And I, I'll never forget the reveal they did with uh, Amy when she's in that sexy dress and she, she blames Charlie for what's happening to her. And mm-hmm. he, he feels sympathetic. And then she raises her head and she has this toothy smile that goes from ear to ear. And I remember in the theater going, ah! Like literally yeah. screaming out loud, and uh, man, uh, when I see stuff like that, I'm like, I, I got to see that again. I mean, even though it was an action flick, whenever I hear the motion tracker from Aliens, I instantly go, "Oh crap!" <laughs> Just like a sound that goes, "Oh no!" Yeah, yeah. Andrew, you throw some titles at us that we haven't yeah, discussed. Yet. I know we don't don't have a, a lot of time left. Um, uh, two films we we have not mentioned, and two of my favorite films, but they're at, at the opposite ends of the spectrum of each other 
Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Oh yeah. Okay. My yeah. favorite com- love that. Favorite comedy of all time. And then Full Metal Jacket. My, fa- wow. my, okay. my, my favorite war movie. Of I all know time. a lot of people. I'm surprised Platoon one. didn't make it on there. Pl- pl- I mean, Platoon is in my top five there you uh, go. All uh, right. favorite war movies. Yeah. Um, and I was just looking up because I, I never looked at uh, the budget for, for Pee Wee. Uh, it made almost six times its budget. Yeah. Uh, it had a budget of, of seven and it made uh, almost uh, 42 million. So, yeah. That's 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 not bad for Tim Burton's first feature film. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I was one of those. I was a young adult getting up early on Saturday mornings to watch Pee Wee's Playhouse, and <laughs> and I loved Pee Wee's Big Adventure, and I, I I did visit his house. You could visit his house in Pasadena, but one of my fondest memories of all time was meeting Paul Rubens at uh, at uh, where was it? The L.A. Comic Con, I believe it was. Where I stood in a long, long line and to get, get a photo op. Got with the him. picture to prove it yes. at your desk. Yeah, it's in my office, yeah. and uh, his passing hit me hard because hey, he's too. one of my all-time favorites. And I was devastated when he went through that controversy yeah. when he got busted in a movie theater in Florida, and yeah. it took a while for him to recover from that. But eventually, people forgave him. Uh, sure. But he, uh, yeah, Pee Wee's Big Adventure is one of my all-time favorite movies, not just of the '80s, but just period. Same here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you said, we're just about out of time. Some titles I want to throw out, uh, of course, Return of the Jedi, 1983, uh, The Last Crusade, where the yep. Indiana Jones trilogy kind of redeemed itself after Temple of Doom and, yep. uh, and The Last Crusade. And the last Indiana Jones movie, as far as I'm concerned. That's that, where I, yeah. That was my train stop. I'm riding <laughs> yeah. off into the sunset. Uh, Ferris Bueller's uh, Day Off. Yeah. Uh, I got to play this. I said it before, and I'll say it again. Life moves pretty fast. You don't stop and look around once in a while. You could miss it. Great, great movie. Uh, Coming to America, one of the all-time greatest comedies, 1988. Uh, We barely scratched the surface on the Rocky movies. As much as I love the first Rocky movie, which came out in the 70s, I am kind of partial to Rocky III. I love Rocky III with uh, Mr. T., and Rocky III was the first time he delivered this line. No, I don't hate Balboa, but I pity the fool, and I will destroy any man who tries to take what I got. What's your prediction for the fight, then? Prediction? Yes, prediction. Pain. <laughs> Mr. T. Gotta love Mr. T. What would the 80s be without And the Mr. Rambo right? movies. Yeah, Ram- oh, the man. Rambo movies, yeah. And um, and then I got to say this, too. Uh, Superman 2, 1980, yeah. kind of kicked off the decade. Uh, I feel that Superman 2 actually uh, superseded the first one. Yes, I it think did. it was a better movie than the first one uh, with the hero and villain dynamics and the storyline. I could have um, taken the origin great. stuff of the first Superman movie and put it in Superman 2, and that would have been, that would have yeah. been a great movie. And just left yeah, it at that. you're right. So uh, that's pretty much, uh, you know, my list. Some other movies I just got to throw out that weren't necessarily box office smashes when they came out. National Lampoon's Vacation yes. uh, did not yes. crack the top 10 for 1983, but has since become a beloved classic. Yep. The Breakfast Club yes. did not crack the top 10 for 1985. Um, Princess Bride. Oh, uh, yeah. Another one yeah. that it was not, it didn't crack the top 10 and it was bested by movies like Three Men and a Baby, which uh, we, we we never mentioned Scarface. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. 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 I I last time I watched Scarface, I'm like, this is almost a comedy when you watch it now. Or, hey, or, or, I'll or, or, to my little friend. Or we, we mentioned that in yes. passing, but Footloose, those cockroach, <laughs> <laughs> cockroach, Footloose, Flashdance. Uh, oh my gosh. What was Dirty Dancing? Yeah. yeah. It's Roadhouse. So many. Road. Yeah, Road. <laughs> Roadhouse. They're, they're doing a, 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 a remake. remake. Yeah, yeah they, well, like a I said, very they, loose remake. They're yeah. nipping at the edges of the 80s movies, what they can get away with. <laughs> yeah. So, again, we're going to wrap things up. But, yeah, but, growing up in the 80s for me as a teenager, I would not change anything. And I would, I would give anything to be able to relive that decade with the movies and music and fashion and the Bengals, my all-time favorite the band. Bengals. Uh, they gosh, they they, they owe you some money for royalties. They do. They do. That's right. <laughs> I heard that story. Uh, but Joe, uh, before we go, uh, uh, Nick and I, uh, we we have uh, a present. What for you? Uh, ah. For not only uh, 
hosting our previous show, our current show, but also everything you do around here. Oh, thanks. Helping everybody, uh, uh, being a great teacher. Yes. Both in the podcast and in, in the studio. I found this at a vintage uh, <laughs> shop in Waterford. I saw it and I thought you would love it. That's an oh. that's an original uh, early '80s uh, <laughs> Mad Magazine. Uh, wow! Uh, and it it talks mostly about uh, '80s films. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So that is yours, my friend. I, and I have to give full that's credit to Andrew on thank this. Thank you so much. A- Andrew yes. did the heavy lifting on that. Basically, <laughs> he, he had the idea. He went and got it. <laughs> How cool! And on that note, we're gonna end with our little ditty. And uh, I believe when we meet again, uh, the Oscars will be the topic yes. of discussion. We're just uh, at the yep. time of this recording, uh, less than two weeks away from the Oscars. I'm so looking forward to it. We will see you again soon. Thank you for listening. Night, everybody. Come to the movies. Watch Charlie Chaplin. And put some sunshine into your day.